First on the program, I'd like to introduce Jim Olchin. Jim uh, is animal science specialist on the uh, Davis campus, who has done uh, a lot of work out here at the field station on a lot of different topics, especially uh, supplementation things. And he's going to kind of be sort of our uh, introductory person on uh, kind of a rotating panel that we'll have going uh, on topics uh, that are happening. So, okay. So for at this, I will turn it over to Jim. Okay, well, welcome. Let's see, one more person I want to introduce is Morgan Doran, the livestock advisor for uh, well, a whole lot of counties around uh, Solano and Napa and uh, Yolo and Sacramento there. Okay, and his, and his sidekick there. So Morgan's in the back. All right, so let's get started here. Is everybody, everybody see the slides with the lights like this? Okay, I think that would be okay, Roger. All right. Okay, my, my job here is to really introduce the next four speakers, but to do that I want to spend just a few minutes going over some, I guess you might say some basic cowherd nutritional things that should be useful as we start talking about, uh, as they start giving their talks. Now if I can figure out how to make this work, there we go. I want to just cover real quickly these four topics, the relative nutritional requirements of cattle uh, through time and uh, as, a, as affected by body size milk production, a little bit about how body condition score and reproduction are related or body fatness, and just give you the punchline of some supplementation strategies and research results that have been done at the field station over the years. Basically, our, the way we feed cattle in this country theoretically is from a, all the collection of the cumulative knowledge which is in a publication on the NRC 2000 requirements of beef cattle, which give, among other things, the uh, energy and protein and the needs of the cattle. The energy needs or the calories, there's really, we often use some, a term called TDN or total digestible nutrients, and then crude protein for the protein requirements. One of the things I want to point out here is this book and the numbers in this book and the information in it is very precise for growing cattle. In fact, an awful lot of the information in that came from work done at University of California. But it's much less precise for cow-calf production. So we're still learning cow-calf nutrition. And we're still doing a lot of that actually right here. We just don't have the precision. Okay, just to orient you and to, then to help you think about cow-calf nutrition and what we do know, I'm going to put some graphs up here, about three or four of them, and they're going to be oriented where this is months to calving, where we have calving at this time here, probably in the fall, at zero, or calving for older cows <clears throat> 12 months earlier, right here. Okay. Now, what we have is energy requirements and protein requirements, these lines here, and you see that basically in terms of the absolute amount of energy or protein, follow each other fairly closely. They're high, they get very high as the animal starts lactating after calving, and then they come down as lactation continues on, and then as weaning, they go down, and we, that's the time of year between weaning and then when they calve again, where we have the lowest nutritional requirements, and then they shoot back up. Heifers, from weaning until, or from breeding until they're going to calf, basically have a requirement that goes on up and gets higher just before gestation, just like, or just before uh, birth, giving birth just like the cows do. So this is the general shape of the curve or the requirements for both protein and energy for cows and, and for heifers. Now let's look at this as it's affected by cow size or by cow milk production because it makes a difference. Here is, the, here is basically the curve that I showed you before for the cow, for the lactating cows. And if we take that 1,200 pound cow and make her a 1,400 pound cow, and this is just energy, so if we're looking at total calories or total TDN, we basically just make that line go up. This is the 1,400 pound cow giving 10 pounds of milk at peak. Okay, so we basically just make that cow that 1,400 pound cow just needs more energy all the time, okay? But look at what happens if we take those cows and increase milk production, and we're gonna have a pretty big increase from 10 to 20 pounds. If we take this 1,200 pound cow and now make her a 
higher milking cow, this milk production, this curve here, goes to this line here and goes way up during lactation, but comes back down to basically the same line when she's dry or when she's pregnant but not lactating. So, and the same thing happens for the larger cow. She needs more energy during lactation. Okay, so bigger cows need more feed. Okay, so a bigger cow needs more feed, but not necessarily better feed. But if you have more milk, you need better diets during lactation because the cows simply can't eat enough of the lower quality feed to get enough energy to milk that high. So these are two basic things that are real important in cow-calf nutrition that we do know. We know that bigger cows need more feed, higher milking cows need better feed okay, during lactation. So this is things to think about which may affect when and how you calve or supplement. I'm going quickly because I told uh, the next speaker I only take 10 minutes. So uh, just want to relate that body condition score is very important. We'll talk about that and you'll hear about that today. Uh, Dr. Moss will talk about that. But basically, we have a system where we have body condition scoring from 1 to 9. We'll use quite often with them 5 being a moderate cow. And there's a lot of words here that describe it. But basically, most of you know that a cow, what a thin cow looks like and a really good condition cow. And when you get into the extremes of threes or less or sevens or more, those animals are, are really pretty fat or too thin. So we're really often looking at this range here. We'd like to have cattle somewhere around here, around calving time, and around in our, our December breeding time, they usually get a little thin. Okay? So they usually get around the fours or something. Bad years, they may get less. But each animal is different. So some animals do better and some animals do less. In some old Australian study, research where they restricted some cows that were in basically average body condition score, and this is time and weeks, as they restricted the cows to lose weight, their condition score went down, and the animals that were cycling, those that would, would be able to be bred, precipitously dropped somewhere when the condition score got somewhere around four and went on down. That's what we can expect in cattle. When we refed those cows, and the number of animals, the percentage of animals in estrus started to go back up. And by the time we got up to about five, most of them were cycling again already. So this is just some things to kind of put in, put in your back pocket for, to remember. Also, if we look at another study where they actually fed cows to stay in these low condition scores uh, from uh, basically at calving time through breeding, you see that the calving interval, or the time between when the animal had its, its calf to its next calf, that calving interval was much shorter as the cow got a little bit fatter. And if we got really thin cows, that calving interval would really get very long. Okay, So just things to remember. The cows that are thin are going to calve, take a while longer to get, come into estrus and are going to calve late. And this slide, which is really hard to read, is just to remind me to say that if you want to bring a cow from a four, from a four to a five or a five to six condition score, it's not really quite that simple. It takes a lot of feed. If you, it actually takes seven pounds of TDN for 60 days to change a average frame cow a condition score. Okay, so how much feed is that? This is that much extra feed based compared to what they're eating. You have to give them this much more feed to get them that extra condition score. We usually try to think of feeding cows over a longer period of time so they get that, so, so we don't try to do it quite so fast. But it would take that many pounds of alfalfa corn or even molasses to get that cow to change a condition score, which is probably around 100 pounds, 80 to 100 pounds in, in those two months. Okay. Uh, past research at the station has showed that high producing rangelands require or may need less supplementation, but rangelands lower productivity and shorter green seasons may have greater supplementation requirements in terms of amount and duration of feeding. I think that sounds like it makes sense. We've, that's been shown here at the field station. The amount, how long the green season is, how long the forage is, do we get, grain, do we get rains in the, in the fall, in October, November, to get this going? That's going to make a big difference on whether we're going to need to supplement that year, too. Okay, so that's been shown here. And also, we would like to have some cues. What can we look at? What can we just, can see, monitor, determine when to supplement? 
And is it an animal or is it a forage thing or is it both? And it's obviously both. One of the things we're doing and with the cattle is looking at condition score to determine when, when to supplement. And so we're talking about looking at using the supplementing cows that are uh, thin and feeding them more. And this is basically sometime in the uh, August, September, October through breeding time. Uh, and this uh, two slides on results. This is a summary of about uh, five years of research that was done here at Field Station in the, uh, about uh, last decade. And basically if we took cows that were stocked kind of moderately or normally, and then those that we put stocked heavily where we actually made them stay on pastures until the residual dry matter, the amount of forage there was fairly low. Uh, and then we did supplemented cows when they, uh, we never supplemented some cows. We fed some cows all the time or gave them supplement all the time basically from uh, uh, about August through uh, February or we separated cows that were thin to be supplemented and did not supplement the fat cows, and that's, or the cows that were above condition score five and a half. We called that strategic supplementation, and we look at pregnancy rate. And basically, if those cows were on moderate amounts of feed, in other words, grazed fairly well, it really didn't make too much difference on their pregnancy rates. However, if they were on the where the grazing pressure was quite high, if we didn't supplement, we had kind of a wreck. We had a lot much uh, much lower pregnancy rates. These are averages over five years. And then, if we did either one of those supplementation strategies, we could increase pregnancy rates up to basically the same as if they were always supplemented. So the strategic type of supplementing, in other words, just separating out the thin cows and feeding them will work just as well as supplementing all the cows for animals that were heavily stocked. In other words, think of this as a bad year, okay, a bad year, okay. And on weaning weights, in this case, supplementation, even in moderate, uh, even in moderate years, did increase weaning weights to some extent all the way, all the way across the board here, too. So regardless of the stocking pressure, the supplementation did improve weaning weights, but again, the weaning weights were higher for all of these animals that were not so heavily stocked. So just some things from the field station research here. So conclusions from that, the body score, cow age, and the effects of weather each year affect those, uh, are very important on, in terms of cow reproductive performance and weaning weights. The, Late pregnancy to the breeding time is really the critical time for the cow nutrition in, the, in these fall calving herds here. Okay? And we have shown here with uh, uh, field station research that supplementing those cows that were uh, thinner would work basically just about as well as just supplementing all the cows and save you some money too. Okay? All right. That's all, I get, that's all the time I get today, but you really came here to hear the people that are going to follow me. And so we're going to hear a little bit about is there a cheaper way to supplement these cows. We're going to also see some more, hear some more about how to determine forage uh, quantity and quality. We're going to talk about some alternative feedstuffs, and that's getting pretty important with the costs of all kinds of inputs nowadays. And then how do we actually monitor the cow's animal condition score.